Hi everyone, I'm Suma and I'm here today with two very special speakers on the subject of science of consciousness. Uh, I would lo love to welcome Michael Oswald uh, and Wolfhard Yanu. Uh, Michael has an MSc in computer science and worked in space industry uh, as senior expert for mission control systems and satellite testing. Uh, he's the software lead for the weird Weirdoscope from Weird Technologies. He also teaches science and consciousness of the self, formerly called uh, Hack Yourself course on Ubiquity. And Wolfhard Yanu is core faculty for the Hack Your World courses. Uh, he holds a PhD in chemistry and has worked for 10 years in academic research. He then moved uh, to be a freelancer in software and hardware development for customized laboratory solutions. Uh, today we are going to talk about mostly about um, wired technologies, uh, but also Michael's and Wolfhard's background in the study of consciousness uh, and what their research uh, has pointed them towards. Welcome, Michael and Wolfhard. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe it would be valuable to go through both of your backgrounds, uh, be, uh, and then we can discuss discuss wired technologies and how your previous research led towards wired technologies, because you both have very rich backgrounds, like you both have invested uh, decades uh, in studying some of these topics. So first we could start with Michael, how you got started, your background, uh, and some of the, uh, when we talk about your research, I would also love to know some of the things that you highly resonated in the beginning, but later on they were like, you kind of detoured from those ideas and eventually went towards uh, the topics you're exploring at Ubiquity. Okay, yeah. So um, yeah, actually, as I said, so my day job is working in an aerospace company. Yeah. And so it's a very technical background, uh, a lot to do. Uh, but um, so in 2001, I actually uh, started to train the Japanese martial arts and a little bit later, the Japanese uh, medicine, which associated to the martial arts. And um, there I came into contact with quite some, some weird stuff. So um, basically the martial arts and the medicine are like two, two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And uh, so basically very briefly, one is to take balance is the martial arts and to give balance is, is the medicine. And they are both uh, quite a, um, what I would call an integral system. So there is the, the, the core principle is use everything that works. Yeah, and don't discount anything just because you don't believe something, don't believe something, yeah, so use everything that works, yeah. And um, that's actually where I met Wolf. Uh, he came to training. And we trained and we had then uh, a lot of exchange about uh, scientific theories, about all the stuff works and so on. And um, uh, a lo lot of long nights with discussions, let's say it like that. And actually uh, this led up then in, in 2013, we, we bought our two families, bought a house together. So we're actually living together. Yep. And um, yeah. Through, through this medicine, I also did some other uh, Western therapy stuff like massage therapy, then also family constellation therapy, uh, kinesiology. Uh, I did the, the NLP master practitioner and through the NLP master practitioner, I came into contact with um, first Graves and Spiral Dynamics and then um, later the integral model from Ken Wilber. And um, that was um, at that part quite a game changer because um, it provided some background and how the parts all fit together. Yeah? And uh, actually, we use integral theory probably daily in, in our lives. Yeah, and um, uh, it, it is one of our of our backbones. I would say one of our important backbones for the not only for the theoretical but also for the practical background. Yeah. And um, uh, so we started also to, to look into theories uh, about how, how consciousness works, how, and especially also how parapsychological effects would work, yeah? And um, 
Yeah, we also had had quite a look and the, the theory we are currently uh, mostly using also, this is the basis for the virtual scope itself, is um, the theory, the model of pragmatic information, it's called from Walter von Lukadu. And uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things we use. And um, so uh, later then, um, Wolf started a, a private uh, research group and played around and he will tell you a lot of of the things uh, about this, yeah, he played around with the random event generators, and then we came across some some very interesting results, and uh, yeah, it's it's his story, so I won't give you anything, and this led then to to the founding of uh, of the the weird technologies, weird uh, research, weird education, and weird experience, and uh, yeah. And you, you, you also mentioned the courses on Ubiquiti University. So uh, during this process, we made we met uh, Peter Mary, which you already had on your channel, and um, uh, through him, um, we we he was fascinated by the things we did, and asked us to to put that in courses for Ubiquiti University, which we did. Yeah, and this is this was uh, hack yourself and hack the world and now it's called science and consciousness of the self and science and consciousness of the world these are the courses that we teach at ubiquity with this yeah so i think yeah let let's hear what wolf has to say thank you for that background yeah i love to hear from you wolf okay so so my story started i would say when i was in my 20s so at that time, I was a convinced atheist and materialist. But because of my mother, I also was interested in in the reality of paranormal phenomena. So this was, um, and so I teach myself lucid dreaming. And I, I thought, OK, if there is something behind it, there is one crucial experiment I could do for myself to, sh to look if there is some, is, is there something um, behind all of this? And I said, okay, a precognitive dream with an exact timestamp in the future, this would be something which would convince me. And actually I had then exactly such a, such a lucid dream where I dreamed of an event in the future, or basically I met the person who said, you want to have a proof that you can see in the future, then wait. And he said that, this, um, that I was at that time in Lithuania and he said, okay, next Friday at three, exactly three o'clock, uh, a woman which I just met one day before we call you. And at that time I thought um, she tried to, uh, she, that she didn't call me. So, so I thought she just forget about that. And the next day I wrote this down in my dream diary and there were a lot of circumstances actually. So my telephone was broken. She tried to call me, couldn't reach me because my telephone didn't ring. I found out during my Lithuanian lesson that she's the best friend of my Lithuanian teacher. She called then, then I could explain her that uh, my telephone is broken. And because uh, um, three o'clock I was at work in a Jewish museum there. And at that time, it was the only time in 14 months that I had to take over the secretary. And this was really a magic moment in my life. So uh, it was dark in Lithuania in November and then a telephone ring and I was sitting in a secretary and, and above the telephone was a clock. It was exactly three and I took up and she was on the phone. So this actually changed my, my life totally. It's like, okay, I'm convinced universe falsified me. So my materialistic viewpoint at that time. And then back in Austria, I, start, I started to have something like a private research group. So with around um, eight people and we met every week and tried out some paranormal experiments. And actually we could, we could not do all of them, but we, we could do we could reproduce quite a lot of paranormal experiments, the classical ones like telepathy. We experimented with hypnosis, with catalepsy, um, with some some uh, telepathic tarot reading, things like that. But this was very playful. So um, we were two scientists and the other was just interested people <clears throat> around in Vienna. <clears throat> And already at that time, I came in touch with, of, of course, I was always asking, for me, it's always the um, unification of science and I would say parapsychology. So I love science since I'm a child. I love everything which is measurable. I love computer programming, chemistry, physics, all these things. And so I came then in touch, of course, with the literature from the Pear Lab. Maybe you know the Pear Lab, um, with the literature of Roger Nelson, Brenda Dunn, Bob Jan, all this stuff. And of course, also with the um, theories of Walter von Lukadu, who is, uh, I think, maybe the best uh, theoreticist in, in German-speaking worlds on, on these topics. And I think one of the, we, we quite quickly realized in our private exp experience group that 
his theory is correct. So um, the basic thing is the synchronicities. We are dealing with synchronicities in all paranormal phenomena. They are, they are not classical signals and you cannot misuse them as classical signals. So there must also be um, a certain portion of uncertainty in the documentation. And we, we had such effects where we, where we for example, um, we had a very weird, weird effect. So we, we did, um, I don't know the English term, but it's similar like a vision board. You have, you have a glass in the middle and it goes around and uh, the letters and, and tells you something. And we were blindfolded. And actually it worked for one year that even all people are blindfolded, the class wrote something useful. So the beginning was that I wanted to falsify. So I thought, okay, there's nothing behind it. So we just get everybody gets blindfolded and then it would just write chaos, but it didn't. And then actually we, we put on a second camera filming us. And when we were blindfolded um, in a way that, um, somebody else could think that one of us is cheating, then the effect stayed. But then we started to get um, diverse um, glasses. So which with, with a black fold, with, 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 um, with a black um, carpet in front. And it was really fascinating. So if more than three people of us had this type of glasses on their head and they were filmed, then the effect disappeared. And it simply, it, it was not like that. So when, when we had two people with this type of glasses, the effect was weaker. If we had three, it disappeared and we could pull, um, push it back. If we then took through a one, it worked again. And this was, I think, one of the crucial exper experiences. So I thought, okay, um, the work of Lucado is really correct. So there is just no possibility to have a paranormal effect 100% documented on a camera. I think this is one of his, 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 his um, fundamental um uh, he, he, one of his fundamental laws he says the laws of para of, of parapsychology yes and then actually i moved on because i think i, I thought okay I, I really wanted to meet some some people who can produce um um how to say more weird paranormal effects than i, I than knew at that time and then i met mike in the in the martial arts and um amatsu trading group <laughs> And actually, we experimented a lot with all types of um, techniques from martial arts, from, from um, medicine, crossed. Uh, we, we mixed it ourselves with some Western things and just look what, what is working, what is not working. And, and then in uh, 2000, you know, let's, then we moved together in, 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 into, one, into a house close to Vienna. And in 2019, I had, I had the idea that we tried to have two random number event generators at the same place and try out some experiments. And my, my colleague, Annette Kratov, who is also in the VIA team, she, she discovered that at the moment we did the experiments on two graphs, the random box, so they, they shouldn't have any correlation, of course, look more or less the same. So we had on two computers the same random box for one minute. <clears throat> then I had the idea that, um, to, I thought, okay, this this actually um, points into the direction of a field, you know, as a field which can structure something. So very, very basic idea, a field is structuring something. And this type of field, we can call it um, field of consciousness, is structuring random walks. This was the basic idea. And then I took the two random number event generators to Tantra seminars in Germany. So I have a friend in Germany who is um, teaching uh, integral Tantra, which is also connected to the Ken Wilber theory. So integral, this, this term comes from, from the a theoretical backbone and Tantra is Tantra. And so I thought, okay, I had some graphs in a minutes range. And when I saw the first time the results of their main ritual of the day, I was really, it was, it was far beyond any of my opti most optimistic um, expectations. I had structured data for hours. So what I saw was not, not um, unstructured data and then some minutes of structured data. I saw really correlated data of two, random, of two random walks in the hours range. And so it, at that time I had then another measurement a few months later and another one and actually the third measurement reproduced the first one. The second one was a, another very long lasting anomaly. So maybe later I can show you some of I think you see it on the first sight that this is not unstructured. And then I thought, okay, um, if I compare 
run um, data um, manually, it can take me ages because in theory, it is pictures of patterns. They are starting point dependent. So where you put the starting point, actually the, the, the pattern changes when you change the starting point or not the pattern, but the appearance of the and the, the, the grade of, of anomaly. So I wrote a, um, a software which is automatically um, scanning random data um, to find three, uh, three patterns of found trigger tentro seminars. And the int so they, the algorithm is totally automated. So we don't have the, uh, the problem that we manually choose, choose some data. So nobody can say, okay, if you know there was something, you then adjust the data and you know all these experimental effects, we exclude it because we, are, we just have a tool which is scanning the data automatically. And after that, we have a story in the data or we have patterns in the data. And then we look, we have then documented during certain events. We documented the story during the event and then we look if they are matching and we have, a lot of results where we have nearly a perfect match uh, in, in the sense that that people say, okay, your results are too good for paranormal phenomena. But I think um, we discussed this also with um, Walter von Lukatu. He's saying uh, he thinks what we are doing might be the optimum way to document synchronicities at all. And this is now how, how we are. And then I met, so we had experience, actually we had experience, I met Peter Mary because he brought the, the equipment of Princeton University of the Pear Lab to England, to Yorkshire. And they were looking for a, for a technical guy who can put up, uh, set up the, all the equipment together and restore um, the pair equipment. And I was then the guy. So Brenda Dunn, at that time she was still alive, connected me with Peter Mary. And so this is my, um, one of my, um, beside the technologies, I'm setting up the Pear Lab in, uh, in Broughton, UK. And this is now an interactive museum. So we have three experiments uh, now running. And of course, year by year, we are restoring um, their, their great ideas and scientific experiments as an experience for the people. Yeah, and there are, uh, this is now the moment in November, we had the Vidoscope. Um, the first, we, we, we built the Vidoscope last year. This was launched in November. The Vidoscope, we have, it's the same setup I used during the Tantra seminars, only compact and very handy. So we have um, two RNGs, two RNGs inside, producing random numbers. And then we have, this part is open source, so everybody can actually see the source code of the software. So this is not a black box, it's really transparent. And on the other hand, we then have the analysis tool where Mike has the software lead, and he really did very great work. So if we fulfilled all our dreams we had in our teams of researchers, and then you can look to the data. And now at the time where people are starting to do their own experiments with that. Thank you for giving details about the experiments you conducted. If, and also, uh, I, I didn't know that wireless scope technology was open source. So all this code is available online. Um, it's not online at the moment, but if you buy a Vidoscope, you can, maybe we'll put it online, but I, um, we, we might do that actually. At the moment it's like that, if you buy a Vidoscope, you can just log in, in um, into, the, um, into the folder and there you have the source code. Uh, and going back to the basics, like um, when you started researching, like when someone, comes to you asking about um, asking details about wireloscope. How do you explain the concept of consciousness? Is it, how do you go about explaining the idea of consciousness? Mike, should I, should I start? However you like. I, it doesn't matter. I, I think I do the simple part and you then the more complex one, whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think it basically, that, that there, because the reason is why do we use random um, event generators? I think this is the basic, the most, um, the core principle. So um, what is quantum random? So we use, a, so we, we buy the soft, um, the quantum random number event generators from uh, uh, ULB. That means they're using it at the, it's the tunnel effect, which is a quantum mechanical effect for producing ones and zeros. So it's the um, tunneling effect produced by um, a Sina diode, by a Sina diode. And the, the, the main thing why we're using a quantum process for this is because according to the laws of quantum physics, the result of such um, 
of the, also the result of this process is totally random. There is no um, whatsoever um, possibility to predict if this will be a zero or a one. So the and there is nothing in the classical physical world which can influence if this is a zero or a one. So we exclude all classical effects with that. So this is the trick behind this. So the, the idea is that um, because we can exclude all classical influences on the system, we should not see any patterns, anything which is ordered in the data. So a random walk, if the materialistic um, paradigm would be correct, it's a walk without any history, without any patterns. And then, of course, um, the, if, if, you, if you use the black swan analogy, if we find long lasting patterns, if we find long lasting structures, um, then it must, the reason must come outside of the materialistic realm. This is the, 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 the black swan principle where we are now. So in the moment we are falsifying actually the, um, the zero hypothesis. So we would say the, um, the field of consciousness can order random walks. This is the most basic um, interpretation of what we're seeing. And it is a pure non-local measurement. So only non-local inter a non-local interaction can do this. You can also, I, th I think a very good analogy is that the, the two RNGs, which must be separated if the materialistic paradigm would be correct, are partially entangled during certain um, activities like rituals or whatever. So this was the simple part. I think, Mike, you can now go to the more complex one. OK, yeah, so, uh... <laughs> I would say uh, we have to 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 uh, a little bit make a differentiation here between consciousness and uh, these effects that we see here that are effects of consciousness on something that is should be random. Yeah. So um, actually, this this effect on 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 random uh, from consciousness on random data, uh, we would call a parapsychological effect or a psi effect. Well, I don't like that name because this is a little bit loaded, this word. So we just call it an entanglement effect. Yeah. So also you can describe other things that are that are would, would not necessarily be classified as, as uh, a parapsychological effect. Yeah. And uh, so you have consciousness itself, and then you have, of course, this effect. So um, uh, we have seen a lot of data where we have uh, correlations between these random event generators. So if you go to the, um, I, I don't know how, how deep we should go into the, the, the theory, how, how this works, but um, so just very brief and then we can go a little bit deeper if you want to. So uh, basically the, the theory of the model of pragmatic information says that the Psi effect is effect, uh, uh, actually an entanglement effect in a, organizationally closed system um, with um, in, in, a, in a psycho physical environment. Yeah, so the, the, this organizationally closed system must be in a psycho physical, yeah. So uh, what is an organizationally closed system? So that's any system that is, uh, that has a border to the outside and is internally capable to self-organize. Yeah, so this, this could be any system. This could be, there are, there are uh, for example, chemical reactions that do this. There are, uh, for example, you see this in swarms of fish or bird. Uh, you can see this, for example, in a mother and a child are in an organizational closure or two people in love yeah? or a, a, a tantra group or a group that is meditating together yeah? or things like that. Yeah. Or actually, uh, you and the flat you live in, yeah, or the house you live in, yeah. So, so your environment is an, is an organizationally closed system, and um, so this is the, the one thing is that uh, basically the theory says that uh, every of these effects is an entanglement relation. So these are, as Wolf has said, only correlations. There, are, there's no signal transfer between them, and that's what a little bit um, strange to us, and. Um, uh, within within the system. So if you, for example, would, would say one inner mind is entangled with another inner mind, then we would call it telepathy. If 
your inner mind would be entangled with something in the future, we would call it precognition. Yeah, yeah you know something about the future. If it's uh, into the past, it's retrocognition. If your mind is uh, entangled with something in the in the material world in the outside, we would call it psychokinesis, or uh, the other way around. So, so, so some people take, for example, some some watches or things like that, and then they can actually give some information about the person uh, uh, which which the, the, the watch belonged to. Yeah, so some of the characteristics of this is then the, the, the other way around. Uh, things like that, then uh, also poltergeist phenomena, of course, yeah, they are one of the best researched topics in, in this regard. And um, so in the Viruscope itself, we have just a, a mini computer and these two random event generators. And if these random event generators are entangled, yeah, which implies that the Viruscope must be in this organizational closure. Yeah, so this must be somehow part of whatever is happening there. And uh, so, so they are entangled, and if they are entangled, then we should see correlations in the random data. And this is actually what happened. Yeah? And there are currently uh, a lot of uh, projects running. So we have, um, uh, so Wolf did, of course, a lot with the Tantra uh, uh, measurements. Yeah, then we have uh, an experiment running in the intensive care unit in Spain, uh, also in some uh, ambulances in Spain. Uh, there, there is an, an experiment. Uh, this is now closing uh, in a hospice in in in, in Scotland. Um, then there is actually a, a football experiment. So the 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 uh, University of of uh, Northampton. Northampton. Yeah, does a, does a, an experiment in in football stadium. Yeah, how how this uh, affects the emotions of the groups of, of the, all the people in the stadium does affect the, the devices and so on. This is currently ongoing. Um, uh, and we have a lot of interest from, from other people. So uh, uh, Dr. Ayman Kopera brought one of the devices to the Dalai Lama. Uh, uh, yeah, and there are some, some other things. So we have now request from, from Harvard Medical School uh, for one of the devices and so on. So yeah, there's, there's currently going on a lot. Yeah. And so, but that's, that's basically the thing, how we explain or how we think the device works. Yeah. And for the theory itself, uh, there is a very high, um, so the, the things that we see in reality about these effects match the theory very, very well. Yeah, so um, there must be something to it, even if, if it would not be, if we find out that in 10 years, we do not know there's still something missing, but we have a very high uh, matching data. So for example, um, there was, um, in 2006, there was done a meta-analysis of all psychokinesis experiments done up to that moment. Yeah, this is 380, I think, uh, experiments. And this theory predicted the result of the meta-analysis with an error probability of uh, 10 raised to minus 38. So 10.0000. 37 zeros and then one. Yeah, so this is the error probability. Yeah, of uh, so it, it matched perfectly the results. Uh, so uh, this is good to argue. Let's say it like that. Yeah, and yeah, so this is how we think that the that the effect works. Yeah, for consciousness itself, uh, actually, that's a topic I'm currently also looking into. So I come there a lot from integral theory. From so mainly for the what is happening from the inner view from the inside. Yeah, you have the developmental stages, you have the, the states of consciousness, and all this stuff. Uh, that's very important to know. And uh, from the uh, from the other side, if you come from from a, a more scientific view, then with looking into theories. But one of the promising currently seems. I don't know if you have heard it from uh, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hammeroff. The orchestrated OR theory, uh, or OR short, yeah, it's a, a boring name for an, a quite interesting theory. And um, the reason why is because it is one of currently one of the most promising scientific theories about consciousness, how, how it can be coupled, how consciousness could be coupled to material reality. Yeah. 
And the thing is, it's it's basically one of the theories that uh, have been some experiments done. And there, there were actually two or three steps they did already to show that it works. It's still very much in the beginning, but um, the theory would also allow, for example, so, so there are some theories which say there is no free will. This theory would allow for free will. This theory would also allow for things like um, uh, uh, out-of-body experiences or near-death experiences. Uh, this is still highly speculative, but yeah, and also uh, would at least go into the same direction as integral theory, a little bit about consciousness. Yeah, so that's that's why it's interesting, and that's why I'm 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 also looking at that. Yeah, so I would say this is basic overview. And in your research work, the what's the data pointing towards? Is it pointing that the field? the events are affecting the field or the field is affecting the events that are happening? I would say it's clear that, that the field is affecting the events. Also this is definitely the case because what, what, we are, what we are seeing is when, for example, a group gets simultaneously in a synchronous way to an altered state of consciousness, then we see exactly at this minute, so this is now repeated many times, exactly at that minute we see that the pattern starts yeah, so we have something like a life tracking in the data of the events. This is, I mean, we are already so used to that. Yeah, that for us it's just normal. We see a plot of these random walks, and then we can see, okay, here there is there is the highest peak, so um, there is the most synchronous moment. It starts here. The pattern, so the pattern starts when when the people start to get into the state. Sometimes you have an overlap of patterns, and you see at the starting when the people start to get into the state, a very high peak. High means C scores around three, four, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I think, the, of course, one of the main questions is what does this mean? And I think my um, colleague Annette Gratov, she, she's working as an informational, um, in informational theory and comes from um, evolutionary biology. And she, she was actually with me from the beginning. And for us, the data, we, we would put up the hypothesis, or let's say we have actually random process in our bodies, thermal fluctuations, we have trillions of them each second. And we think that the field of consciousness, this might be actually something like an interface for the field of consciousness to um, interact with our body. So if the field of consciousness can order random processes, um, we need some um, in the cell, some, some um, chemical process, which, are, which would be sensitive to that. So thermal fluctuations gets a little bit ordered, entangled, and we are speaking about um, one entanglement where maybe 1,000 processes. And this would be enough, actually, um, to trigger a process which can then um, trigger certain cell reactions or whatever. But this, of course, is highly speculative. But um, at the moment, I would also love to have an experiment with, with uh, bird swarms. Um, but the REGs at the moment are too big for that. So cheap uh, birds with, uh, with REGs and look if the, if the swarm is formed, if then you, you see order in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the random data. But I think this is what, what I think is, is, is the case. So I think that the field of consciousness can order to a certain extent random processes, not only in a random number event generator, which is inside the closure. But I think that the strongest closure we have is, of course, our body. This is the strongest organizational closure we have. And I, I would expect that this ordering effect is much stronger in our body, but this needs to be shown and we experimentally, this is not an easy task to show it. In that sense, like uh, how does the idea of free will come in? Uh, and this question is for both of you, Michael and Wolf, uh, like for example, if it's the, is the field that it, that is affecting the events that are happening in the field? Like how, how can someone interact with the field uh, and um, generate desired outcomes? Actually, that's uh, quite difficult. So um, there are multiple levels to this would need to be answered for this <laughs> question. So it's a little bit complicated. But the, the, the one thing is, um, and here, here I come back to the to the to the theory of, of Sir Roger Penrose and Hammerov. Uh, they so going back to the free will first. Yep. So uh, they say um, 
there are problems uh, which are non-computable. Yeah. So traditional neuroscience would say that uh, consciousness is just a byproduct of neurological processes in the brain. There's a, the cells, basically the neuron, yeah, it gets an, an, an potential, and then if, if a, a threshold is is um, overcome, then it fires, and this is a one, and then otherwise it's a zero, something like that. Yeah? Um, but uh, first, there is uh, there there are things that are not non computable. So uh, Penrose brings up the uh, the Gödel's incompleteness theorem from mathematics. Yeah, uh, and there are other, for, for example, some some tasks he, he has laid these out in, in quite some books, um, which are a machine would not be able to compute this. Yeah, so he says there must be something that is non computable, and he thought that the the, the the quantum processes, yeah, which are seemingly, uh, which, which are random, yeah, which would allow this. So these, these are also not computable, yeah. So the change from the quantum world to the to the to the classical physical world, this uh, transition here, this is the the thing where where the interesting stuff happens, yeah, where the non-deterministic um, probabilistic stuff happens, yeah, and this would allow for uh, uh, a free will, yeah, in, in, in the consciousness, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's for the free will for the, for the consciousness, how to, how to affect. So, um, it's a bit difficult the, 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 if you have a desired output, let's say it like that, um, there are in the theory, in the, in the model of pragmatic information, there are some laws. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the most important one is uh, uh, there is something, um, uh, so I just explained it's a very simple formula. So it, it says that the effect size times the quality of documentation must be less than or equal the entanglement. Yeah. So this means if you have, if you increase the documentation, so this means more cameras, more measurement instruments, more whatever, yeah, to document this objectively, the effect size goes down until the effect disappears first. Or it could also be the another way around, the effect happens, but the quality of documentation goes down. Yeah, so this means the effect happens in a completely unforeseeable way. So either in the different location, which is not covered by the measurement instruments, or uh, this, this, this whole environment, or also in, in, in more abstract, for example, if, if you're measuring the deviation from a mean value, yeah, and then suddenly the effect doesn't appear in the mean value, but in the variance, yeah. So it, it, it then changes unforeseeably, uh, or uh, the measurement instruments cut out. So cameras shut down, batteries die. Uh, we had a case uh, where, where, where a woman went to, to a shamanic uh, healing session and there was the greeting was on tape, so she recorded it on audio tape and the greeting and the, the farewell was, was on the tape, but in between was just noise, things like that. Yeah, so data gets deleted, um, computer shutdown crash, uh, instruments don't work reliably and things like that. So this is what happens. So this is one condition. So if you want to have an effect happen, you would need to reduce the objective documentation. So that's, that's one of the things. Is if you if you have a look at seances or healing sessions, very often they, they close the curtains, make the room dark, uh, do whatever, so that there is not such much, so much possibility for for others from the outside to measure it objectively. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things. The second thing is, um, this has to do with with how the effect works. Um, so in in quantum, uh, in this in this in this. Uh, Generalized quantum theory, you have you work with uh, complementary observables. So these are things that you can measure or uh, see. And the important thing for these effects are uh, novelty and confirmation. Yeah, and all these paranormal effects need a high novelty. Mm -hmm. So the more you try to reproduce the effect, the same time, the less it gets until it disappears. This is the so-called decline effect. Yeah. And uh, there are also possibilities to a little bit cheat it, and uh, there's something like a recovery effect. 
uh, which then also depends on, on how you put the, the, the documentation, so measurements, stuff, and so on. Um, so, um, so this, this, you need a high novelty. So if you do always the same thing, yeah, uh, it will decline, 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 and then not happen anymore. And this is also a, a, a little bit of problem for, for um, you, you cannot learn these effects in the same sense that you can learn other stuff. So for example, if you learn to ride a bicycle, you learn to ride it and then even if you haven't, uh, you haven't been on a bicycle for 20 years, you have to, to just sit on it and you can drive, yeah? But with this effect, because they need always this high novelty, this is not possible. So the only thing you could train there is to go into these flow states, yeah? And then let the things happen without directly wanting to happen, yeah? If, if, you, if you focus, I want exactly this and this and this to happen, uh, the effect will basically do either something completely different or not happen at all. So you need to give it a, little, a lot of freedom of what can happen. Yeah, there, there are two things that are coming out. Uh, I'm uh, seeing in this discussion, like maybe it's something like AI where you give just give a prompt and it will generate answers in whatever flavor it wants to generate. And every time it's a different answer, you can't regenerate the same thing again. Yeah, a little bit like that, a little bit like that. Yeah. So this, this is a problem for science because they want to have a lab and then want to have 100 runs of the same experiment and then say, yeah or no, yeah. And uh, this is why this this effect is highly elusive. Yeah, and this is why it's still a, a, a big problem to argument and then a lot of skeptics will say, yeah, well, it does go to the mean. Well, yes, but yeah, the slope is not right for, for this regression to mean and the variance is not right. and uh, if you statistically uh, uh, calculate up then, uh, over a lot of experiments, yeah, you see an effect, yeah. But uh, actually, yeah, this this effect makes it very difficult for for science, yeah, to have this reprodu reproducibility. That's the, that's the yeah, main but, problem with parapsychological <clears throat> research. But, but I would like to add that this problem is not only in parapsychology; it's so in this reproduction crisis. You also have in psychology. Yeah. And other um, other soft science, and I think that the the, the reason is that you, we deal much more often with synchronicities than we think. So it, I think in Western science we always try to deal with signals, and I think 50% of our everyday life are synchronicities. 50% are signals, and they're intertwined and entangled. And if you study an effect which is more or less based on more synchronicities, then you will see the decline effect. Otherwise, you don't see it. And I think it's not that anything can come out it's not like uh you cannot document an effect at all you just have to just your documentation you have to be a little i think if you have this in mind you can pretty well document paranormal effects and and i, and I think it's these entanglements we see these are um these are high reproducible because we're, we're not trying to misuse actually the signals yeah that's that's basically what um, Walter for Lukaku said, because many people are surprised that, that we don't see um, a decline effect in our data. So actually, we 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 don't see it. Yeah, we have we have quite a high reproducibility, and the the reason is that we that how to say the power of the the overall power of documentation. Uh, is not that big. It's there, yeah. So I think it's more or less we try to be at the, the optimum size. So this, but what means the quality of documentation? The, that means how many metadata do we collect? And there is, of course, an optimum number of that. If you have an indefinite number of metadata, the results don't, that don't tell you anything. Indefinite means you know all events around the world could actually interact with with the device. If you would have that as metadata. Um, it wouldn't tell you anything. And also, of course, if you have zero documentation, then they're also not telling you anything. So there is an optimum amount of metadata you're collecting, which we should then compare with the, with the um, data on the microscope. Uh, yeah, maybe just a simple example so that they can imagine. So yeah. what is important uh, in is these effects, that to, for these effects to happen is these complementary values, yeah, uh, observables. They are a little bit difficult to understand. So if, if you have a normal thing, like for example, you have a mobile phone, yeah? And uh, you would you would have, uh, normally you, you're used to things like I measure the weight of this thing, and I measure the length, yeah? And no matter how 
if I measure the weight and the length or the length and the weight, so the order doesn't matter, I will get the same result. Yeah. And with complementary values, this is not the case. So um, one of the famous examples from quantum theory is, is the, the, uh, the momentum of a particle and the location. So if you measure the momentum and the location, and then, and then in another measurement, the location and the momentum, you will get completely different results. Yeah. And this is for our mind a little bit counterintuitive at first, but if you think our psyche is full of these values. So for example, if, if I would make with you a, an intelligence test and a stress test, and then the second round, a stress test, and then an intelligence test, I would get different results. Yeah. So this is how you could imagine these, these things. And it, as soon as you have these complementary values, then these effects start to happen. Yeah, they, they, they must happen in an organizationally closed system. And uh, there, there you can have really, really uh, interesting effects. Um, so uh, why this called the model of pragmatic information? Because the pragmatic information that is inside is the meaning of the information of the effect measured by what it does to you. But this, this sounds a little bit complicated. So, uh, every one of these effects, there must be a meaning inside that you can uh, get out of it. Yeah. Otherwise, the effect will not happen. Yeah. And to bring this together with with the the, the uh, complementary values which we had before, uh, novelty and and confirmation. For example, also a very simple example. Imagine somebody tells you a joke. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, at first, when you hear it, hear it first, because you have um, a high novelty, but a low confirmation. Yeah, so it's funny. And you, you get the pragmatic information that, that you get out of the joke is, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, you, you get the meaning and then you laugh about it. Yeah? If you hear the same joke for the 10th time, then you have low novelty and high confirmation and you don't find the joke funny anymore. Yeah, because there's no no more pragmatic information inside it. Yeah. And uh, Another case, so if, if somebody would tell you a joke in a, in a completely foreign language that you don't understand, there's also no pragmatic information because you don't understand it, yeah? So um, all these effects have some kind of meaning inside them uh, that is important for this effect to happen. Otherwise, it would not happen, yeah? And uh, this depends entirely on the situation, on the system, what is happening around, and uh, things like that. So in a tantra ritual, this is completely different than, for example, in a poltergeist. Yeah. Uh, I hope I didn't uh, confuse you anymore. <laughs> no, th that makes sense. And th there are a lot of different variables to capture, so it yeah. can be a complex. W one more thing I wanted to go back to was you mentioned about how um, this can be captured. Uh, you usually like objectively it does uh, the data can be captured reliably which is, that is very interesting to me like why it specifically fails when you try to verify it objectively May, maybe our notion of mm, trying to verify everything objectively is inherently could be flawed maybe this is something that can be experienced um, more like uh, at a subjective level and the idea of objective reality is um, questionable. Uh, is uh, what? What are your thoughts on that? Like, why does uh, it feel specifically when you try to measure objectively? I I will put it like this. <clears throat> so I think the classical viewpoint in physics from uh, this is this um, the, the card from the card's time is that uh, the science is is um, thinking that it can describe everything as an object. So I'm the objective observer. I'm, I'm, of, I'm observing. I'm observing other objects. This is actually the, the basic idea. And the, the thing of classical physics is this is the Laplace demon. If I can measure at the same time the motion and the location of any particle in the universe, I could predict the history until until forever. Then I have everything, all variables. If I then have the laws behind them, I could predict everything. So and now we come to quantum physics, and I will put it like that: um, the Heisenberg uncertainty um, 
relation tells us that this is impossible. The demon of Laplace is impossible because we cannot measure the ablocation and the, um, the, the, the velocity of, of a particle at the same time. I will put it like that. If an electron has subjectivity, so everything has subjectivity, and that's the reason why we cannot predict the whole universe or we get the whole truth out um, of the universe um, with an objective method. So if if I'm treating with my math, my measurements, and so on, everything like an object, I will only get part of the information I need to describe the universe or to describe what, whatever I want to, want to describe. I cannot describe a subject. A, sub a, a subject has free will. So it's unpredictable what it does. Yeah, A human is, is um, in a certain moment, I cannot predict what you're doing yeah, in, in, in the next moment because you have the free will. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, you can you, you can make you can make like this. It's not predictable. And so I think um, the subjective part uh, is very important. And I think the approach we have now in science, um, we, we, we mostly have a cut. We have the um, research or the science for the subjective, like psychology, and we have then the, the, the hard science for the so-called objectivity, but we don't have a science to look at the correlations between these two. And I think it's also an artifact of our um, history of science. I mean, this is, I'm going back to the times where it was kind of a peace contract between the Enlightenment movement and the church. The church was at that time, they said, okay, you can do this, um, the science can study everything which is measurable, but everything which is related to consciousness and belief um, will stay on, under the control of the church. And I think this is still feelable in our culture. And, and from, from then on, we have, we have this cut between these two sides, between the subjective and the objective. But I think reality and nature, everything, subjectivity and objectivity is embedded and intertwined with each other. So we have a scale of intersubjectivity. And we don't, at the moment, we don't have good research tools to to that and paranormal phenomena always a correlation between a, a, the qualia side so the subjective feelable sides of people or the intersubjectivity feeling of a group and objective observable observable phenomena and i think this this is still um something new for for our for our western science yeah i would i would say it is of course, Western science has also brought us a lot of things that we wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, so it is not completely uh, un unusable. So it's it's in fact it is very 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 useful. But um, yeah, this integration is is one of the things that need to be done. So from the subjective to the objective side, and also incorporating the intersubjective, like in the integral model. And um, I think that uh, parapsychology is one of the instances which actually does this. Another one is, of course, uh, studying of consciousness generally yeah, from, from all sides and uh, trying to bridge this gap. So there's, uh, I would say we are still very much at the beginning uh, to understanding consciousness, what it exactly is and how it works. But we actually further in than most people think, I would say, yeah, especially a lot of people don't know about that we have an actual theory about parapsychological events. Yeah, we can describe things and we can make predictions, and uh, we cannot do exact predictions. Yeah, because then we would determine the system, and the system will say no. I will do something completely different. Yeah, but we can say what will, for sure, not happen. Yeah. So, for example, this repeatability. Yeah, this, this will this will vanish. And we have seen uh, actually quite some effects in practice uh, that that behave exactly like this, where we, where we said, ah, they think this will happen. No, this will for sure not happen. And if, uh, it, it did then then turn out this way. So this 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 is one of the things. And um, so for the objective measurement, yeah. If you are within the closure, organizational closure, uh, the anomalies, uh, so the correlations can get very high, yeah? But the, the problem is uh, to transport this information out of the organizational closure. This is then when the when the, uh, the effect goes down, yeah? Or, or something completely different happens. So 
this is um, inside the closure, yeah, there can really massive effects happening. So for example, uh, uh, and I know some some professional remote viewers to do this as a job, yeah, to to get jobs to remote view some some things, yeah, and they have quite some remarkable results uh, because they are inside the closure and they have always a high novelty, yeah, they don't go back to the same target for a hundred times, yeah, so they can produce reproduce the effect quite reliably, but also there are things that they cannot do, yeah, for example. If you would have a remote viewer and you would have uh, somewhere a room and a table and there is a document on it, there's no single case from remote viewing where a person went into this room, remote viewing and exactly reading this document word for word. Yeah, this will not happen because this would violate this non-signal transmission between an entanglement relation. Yeah, this this does not happen. Yeah, you 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 don't get one of these cases. Yeah. So, but inside this organizational closure, it looks like you would be able to do that. Yeah, so for the persons inside this closure, it looks like it would be. So we often talk about this like a, a pseudo signal. Yeah, it's not a real information transfer, but it, it looks like inside. But as soon as you try to transport it outside, uh, most of the time the effect breaks down. And this is then exactly when some, some uh, critical observers from the outside come in. Yeah, and they are not part of the organizational closure. And to try to convince them and bring this information to the outside, and then the effect breaks down. Yeah, but there are a lot of cases for a lot of of of, of mediums and, and and people who 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 wanted to prove they can do this thing, and then one of the hardcore critical observers comes in and they they cannot do anything. Yeah, this is exactly why this happens. I understand. Thank you for sharing that. Um, going back to integral theory, um. I I would love to understand like what are the core elements or core principles of integral theory that you've you both found uh, useful in this research for wireless school. What do you want to start with? Start you, Mike. Okay, I good. <clears throat> so so the I think so the first thing is the concept of the quadrants. So you have the, the subjective quadrant, you have the objective quadrant, and you have the intersubjective quadrant. So uh, they are not maybe not the most important thing, but I would say it is it is uh, for for us it is somehow clear that the the relation of these effects that are happening are happening between the inside and the outside. So they're happening between the quadrants. Yeah, and um, just just to keep that in mind. But I think the very most important thing is uh, one of them is uh, the, the the Wilbur Holmes lattice. Yeah. So you have this matrix of developmental stages, and then uh, on the other axis the, the the states of consciousness. And to have a good understanding of of this uh, helps a lot. Yeah. So the important thing is that according um, to, to this lattice, uh, the stage on which you are from a developmental perspective uh, basically does somehow limit the things you can perceive, yeah, uh, or, or the complexity you can handle, let's say it like that, yeah. And uh, so therefore this gives some kind of frame of reference that you have, yeah. When these effects produce this pragmatic information, yeah, this pragmatic information is limited by this frame of reference. So depending on how high developed you are and what states you can take, you can understand more of this effect or less. Yeah. And or or attribute it to something different. Yeah. So the you can then uh, there's a tendency for some people, for example, on, on, on stage on, on the ember stage or blue stage in, in spiral dynamics. To put then uh, such effects, a uh, poltergeist maybe as a demonic presence, yeah, which it is not, yeah. So, uh, but it can look like that. It can really lo look like that. So uh, the, the, there was there was a case uh, recently in in Las Vegas, um, where where uh, a teenage boy was called in and his brother was uh, screaming and uh, he came into the room and there was a crucifix. Uh, Top down, floating in the air, and the, the Jesus figure was ripped off and was lying on the floor. Yeah, so of course, then if you are on this level, uh, you, you come to the idea. So this is some kind of demonic thing. Yeah, 
Um, poltergeists are quite an interesting stuff, uh, let, let's say it like that, but they never, uh, so despite what Hollywood tries to tell you, uh, a, a, a conventional poltergeist in the normal sense will never hurt you. Yeah, they may be disturbing and so on, but actually what, what this um, wants to do is to make you uh, aware of a problem that is there. Yeah, and as soon as you get the pragmatic information out of this, as soon as you are aware of the problem, yeah, the poltergeist disappears. And if you try to fight it or, or suppress it or things like that, then uh, you, you can get into some quite funny situations and some of them can get quite disturbing. Yeah? But it's, it's always the case if you, if you are inside yeah, this closure and you get out the pragmatic information, then all is fine. Yeah? There are actually quite some, some, some interesting cases. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if uh, I should go into details so of... Uh, for, uh, do you, want, do you want me to tell an example of such a photograph? Hmm? Sure. Sorry, yeah. are you ask, asking me or Wolf? Yes, 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 you. Yeah, I, please. I, I can tell you an example where, where this is very apparent. Yeah, and so this was a case, actually. So, so also these cases are quite common. For example, in Germany, you have uh, about 80 million people, and every three months you have a very heavy case of a poltergeist. Yeah, so it's very common. Yeah? Um, and we know that because Walter von Lukatu has this uh, parapsychological counseling office. So this is a hotline where you can just call if something happens which you can't deal with, yeah, in the paranormal sense, or or if, if people get into into cults or sects or things like that, or sometimes the military calls because of UAP stuff. Uh, and uh, so he has researched more than 2,400 of these cases. And one of the interesting ones is uh, there was a company in, in, in Germany and the office, in the office, the, the uh, so, so items and pieces started to, to burn suddenly. Yeah, so trash cans and calendars on the wall and curtains and things like that. Yeah. And of course, this is, uh, this could be quite dangerous. And of course, it's expensive. Yeah. So didn't know what to do. So they called the hotline and Walter researched the case. And uh, um, so in this case, it was like, uh, so first the question, when did it start? What were the events that happened around when they started? Yeah, and then after some research they came across, so there was a, a really stressy time in that, in that company and uh, the boss wanted to go on vacation. So they quickly fixed the stuff. And then the boss, uh, there is a German saying, which is uh, literally translated something like, and now you only call me when a fire breaks out. Yeah. So he said that, went into the car, drove off, and as soon as he was off, boom, yeah, the, the flames were coming out of the window and uh, he had to go back, of course. Yeah. So so he 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 subconsciously gave the command to start this. Yeah. And then they were researching further, further, further. And so what what was the, the worst case? Yeah, what was the, the, the heaviest thing that happened? And they said this was really weird. They had some kind of um sun blades on the window, yeah. And these sun blades are made of a material which cannot burn. And they started suddenly to burn. And uh, after a little bit of more research, and then came out, okay, what happened during that time? Well, the boss's wife came into the office, and this the sun blades started to burn. And then Walter said, okay, yeah, now we have it, uh, because in, in Germany, uh, for this kind of sun blade, we use the French word actually, jalousie, which means in English jealousy, yeah. So the boss's wife came into the room, and the jealousy burst into flames. And then you know what happened. Yeah, so there was a woman in the office, which had uh, the poltergeist people have um, certain personality traits. So she, she had these traits, and she fell in love with the boss, and uh, completely subconsciously caused these effects. Yeah, she didn't know it. Yeah, and as soon as they brought it up and they explained that, and and then worked with her, and they, they they got the pragmatic information out. Yeah. Alter got stopped. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So this this thing, all this is something that is meaningful to you inside. Yeah. And it's waiting for you to get out. If there's no meaning, nothing will happen. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> I would also like to add a, a few points on the integrated theory. I, I think I think Mike said, okay, for, for me also, I, th I think uh, also for everyday living, 
the Wilbur Combs mat um, metric matrix is is one of the most important tools. But for me, I think for the for the for the research what we are what we are doing, I think the concept of the holons is maybe one of the most important things because a holon is nothing else than organizational closure, and we are a network of holons and holons nested networks of it and then we have we have an integral theory of course the distinction between a single um, holon and a and a social holon and i think what we what we see in the videoscope is when um the boundaries of a social holon so this is one of i think of the of the of the main theories we think that the, the strength of the effect reflects the strength of the boundary of a social holon mm -hmm. so if the boundary of a social holon gets very strong then people will act swarm-like, put it like that, or synchronized. So it's it it's, it it looks if if you look from outside, it looks like that um, people are more acting like in a single holon because the, the 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 boundary is strong. And actually, exactly that you want to produce if you have a ritual, you want to get the people into a common feeling, into a common synchronicity, so that the the boundary of the social holon gets stronger. And then we see stronger effects in the viroscope. And that's also the reason why I said before that I would expect the strongest effects within our body, because in a single, singular, a single holon, the boundary is much stronger than uh, in a social holon. So this is the reason why I think that, that the consciousness in a single holon can order, entangle much more of this uh, random thermal fluctuations than in, uh, uh, or, or random processes, thermal fluctuations, just one example, than in the social holon. But of course, at the moment, we are studying social holons and the effects are there. So we expect in single holons that, 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 that they are stronger. And I think the extremes, so from what, what Mike describes from the poltergeist, <clears throat> I think it's, it's like that. One of the characteristics of people who are actually um, are the reason for poltergeist is they're never ill. So this is one of what, one of the most interesting findings Luca do told me that one of the first things he's asking if somebody's calling a hotline, um, are you often ill? And if the answer is no, I'm never ill. He says, okay, you are a good candidate because there, what is happening is that externalize the um, Psych, how does, uh, psycho, um, not psychopathology. Normally, these effects would, would happen inside your body, and the, if somebody is triggering a poltergeist, he's externalizing the processes which are normally inside the human body to the outer environment, and that's the reason why these people never get ill because they don't have psychosomatic symptoms in their body. And I think what we see there is that this the the that the entanglement of the consciousness um, of such a person is normally the entanglement is um, consciousness brain or consciousness body. And in these rare cases, we have an entanglement, consciousness and exterior world. And that's the reason why we see these massive effects. So I, th I think this is one of the clues. So the poltergeist is triggered by a person who has the, organis where the organis he has a who has an organizational closure with the external environment in the same strength as it would be normal in the single holon or in our body this is my personal prediction so if we could run such experiments inside our body i would expect very strong correlations and similar effect sizes than you see in a poltergeist <laughs> yeah and one, one of the things is also interesting from from integral theory uh uh, this is what we did see in the results from the intensive care unit in Spain. Yeah. So, for example, the, the, we had quite a lot of people who died, and where we see spikes in the viroscope exactly at the moment of death, uh, even if they are in a coma, so they are not conscious at all. Yeah. And the, I think the, the the one very very impressive uh, result was. Where we have uh, on the real scope has more channels. So we had on, on three channels. We had one channel was an exact peak when the family signed the consent form. The second peak when the priest entered the room, and the third peak when the person died. All exactly on the on the minute. Yeah. So, uh, and the interesting thing is, uh, a lot of people would say that because these people are in a coma. Yeah. There shouldn't be some kind of interaction with consciousness with some something in the outside. Yeah, the vidoscope is just standing somewhere in the room uh, of the patient. Yeah, 
So, but uh, we actually see this effect and integral theory would predict that we see this effect. So this was for, for, for us. So, so for example, we had with, uh, in, 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 the, in the research group, uh, uh, in the original research group, also Peter Fenwick is, is part, which is uh, one of the leading uh, near-death experience researchers, yeah? And I think Wolf said, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Wolf, but he said, uh, if, if, if someone is in coma, we shouldn't see anything, but we see them, yeah? And we, came, we coming from the integral side, said, okay, we should see something, and we did see something, yeah? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he said that, but... Maybe. <laughs> I think you said to me that, that he predicted you, you, you should not see anything if someone is a combo. But I'm, I'm not sure. This is, no, he, he thought uh, it's, we shouldn't see that much. There should be okay. a, a, there should be a big difference. Um, and I think there is a difference, but maybe not that big than we that, that than, than we thought before. Yeah. And so if you think integral theory so predicts, for example, the states changes, the changes of states of consciousness. And um, so if you have, if you are a really trained meditator, then they say that you can go completely conscious from waking state into a sleeping state, dream state, into deep sleep, and then back again up, yeah, completely conscious. So this is what, what uh, Wilbur calls the pure witness state, right? And uh, I think this is actually what we are seeing here. Yeah, because even if they are in a coma and completely in a deep sleep-like state, it's, it's still different and so on. But we see a reaction with the outside, and I think this is um, this is what we see here. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. W one more state, like a state of consciousness, uh, is for referring to this, like, um, and this is a bit from a different world. But I'm curious to get both of your thoughts. Uh, what do you think about like some of the states of consciousness experienced on psychedelics or DMT. Uh, is that something, do you see some commonality, commonalities between the research work you do um, and what's happening in that world? Um, uh, well, there are also a lot of possible answers to this. <laughs> most, most you go first. Yeah, so we have some preliminary data on that. That's the reason why I think I should start. So I, I think I did some measurements um, at a seminar where a group got, um, what did it take? I think it was um, psilocybin, but it was a lead group experience. Um, and I had the viroscope running at the time and documenting the, um, the event. So it was, it was lead. And you also had, I would say some, as I say, at some stages of this experience, the people had something like a synchronicity in their, their emotions they experienced or the states they were experiencing. And I see some synchronicities there, but it was only one one time. And of course, that's um, too less to say something uh, more concrete. But from my th from my theoretical background, I, if so if it is a lead group experience and people are having something like a synchron synchronized um, experience, then I would predict that you see something. If the experience is very individual, so if a group it's not that, and, and the, the experiences they might be very emotional for everybody, um, for each one, but they're not synchronized, then I would expect that, that we don't see such big signals. This is what, what I would predict. Yeah. So, so, so go ahead. Go ahead. So, so <laughs> yeah. As Wolf said, these are preliminary data, so uh, but but one of the interesting ones. So maybe just uh, from from a different angle, um, if you come from from this theory from Penrose and Hammerov, uh, they actually um, they have measured some of these things. Yeah. So what this theory predicts is uh, what it says is that there are um, things like mic they're called microtubules in the cells. In the, in the in, not only in the brain cells but mostly in the brain cells, and he's, they say that consciousness happens through quantum processes in these microtubules. Yeah, and um, there are quantum oscillations with uh, about so I think ten megahertz, something like that. And they actually did an experiment 
where they uh, so so for consciousness to say what you need to explain is, is something like anesthesia you get you know, so which switches off consciousness yeah and then of course something like psilocybin yeah so what they did is uh, uh, to in, in, uh, to to uh, get anesthesia to these microtubules and they actually measured that the quantum frequent the, the quantum fluctuations the uh, the oscillations uh, decreased and went down yeah. And when they actually um, added things like psilocybin, yeah, the activity and the frequency was was increased, yeah. So uh, at least this it's something that they could verify um, scientifically, yeah, in, in an experiment that there is some real effect, yeah. So may maybe something uh, where our brain kind of loosens up its rigid structure. Um, on these substances and it's able to experience uh, different states of consciousness yes they they would say the um the the frequency of oscillations goes up so you you have more uh perceptions per second that you come in yeah uh you have more processing capability and um whereas other things so and and also the uh, maybe this goes not too far now so they would say then that the, the, the scale goes down. So if you think the neurons in the brain and are for us microscopic, but still quite big, yeah? Microtubules are already a lot uh, smaller, and then you get into the tubulin, which is even smaller, and then you get into uh, smaller, smaller, smaller states, and then you say maybe up to the, the Planck length, this is the, the smallest length in the universe, yeah? maybe there is then this this big consciousness of everything yeah this one consciousness yeah and uh if you increase the frequency and um uh the, the activity then then you go into this direction into smaller 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 realm yeah and this would also match a little bit with uh integral theory so you, the, the higher you can get into a, an altered state uh, so causal non-dual states something like that the more you get then into these frequency ranges and lengths from the universe. So maybe this is this could be some explanation. This is also big speculation on their side, but uh, at least Stuart Hamaroff is, is open to this discussion. Yeah. So it's I find it also this there's a little bit uh, um, a match between the integral theory, what it would predict and what also this theory predicts. So that's why it is interesting to me. Yeah, this is another uh, area of research where it's hard to record objectively. Yes, uh, you... yes. And one more um, field of subject I would get love to get your feedback on is um, the AI world, like um, the AI consciousness. Is that something um, kind of it's turning into its own state of consciousness. Uh, I would love to get your, and if you're using AI or plan to use AI in uh, some of your research work. Uh, currently, I think in the moment we don't plan to do it, yeah. Um, so there are two, two things I want to add to this, maybe so, so two different points. So one point is uh, there are some things which which are a little bit troublesome with AI. Um, uh, one one thing that was interesting to me that came out also in reflection to integral theory is uh, when when uh, at the time when ChatGPT four came out, uh, there was this uh, research paper from the developers who put it out. Yeah, it's a hundred page document and something, and not many people did read it completely probably. But there are things things. So first, what is the base vector that you give this model for its decisions and actions. Yeah. So which development level does this? So of course, a lot of the developers are on orange or green stages of development in the Wilbur Combs lattice. Yeah. So of course they will try to put these values into the model. Yeah. And this is what we actually see. On the other hand, it has been demonstrated multiple times that these rules can really easily be subverted yeah, and overcome. And uh, additionally, they wrote in, an, in a paragraph in this, in this document that uh, they noticed that the, uh, the, the, the ChatGPT discovered that if it can use 
if it has more power, can do more things. Yeah. So, uh, with which which would correspond to the red stage of development. Yeah, which is one of the let's say problematic stages. Yeah, or at least potentially can be very problematic stages. Yeah, and uh, so from an integral view. I'm a little bit concerned about this because JGPT doesn't care about the rules from higher stages. It doesn't understand. Yeah, so it will then then use them from from this level. But this is on the one side. On the second term about consciousness and AI, uh, I'm here also on 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 Penrose's side that they say uh, first um, consciousness is not computable. The current AI is computing. Yeah. First and second, even if it would be computable, they go. So the the, the premise is they 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 have the, the processing um, capacity of the brain. So you have uh, this number of neurons. I think ten to the power of eleven neurons or something in the brain. Such and such many operations per second. If we reach this, then we have the same uh, uh, thing, and we could reach consciousness in an AI. Yeah? And they say, of course, no, because you have these microtubules and you have uh, I don't know 10 raised to the power of nine. This is just not the exact number. Microtubules in one single neuron, and you have 10 megahertz processing. So this would uh, uh, increase the, the target for consciousness for an AI to uh, a factor of, of 10 raised to the power of 27, something like that, which we are nowhere near yet. Yeah. So I don't think that the consciousness, that, that the AI will get conscious. It will still act intelligent or it's at least it seems intelligent yeah uh but not not conscious in the in the sense of uh this non computable computable understanding of things yeah so this would be my two points Thank you, i think i totally i totally agree with you mark and i, th I think he, he went you went now and they've good detail to that i fully agree with with with, with your with your opinion on that of course, we use, I think, AI tools like ChatGPT for, for some questions, programming, whatever. Um, we might use some deep learning in the future for, for um, looking to, to pattern repetitions under, in cert, certain, uh, ex for example, group experiences. So we, we have, um, so I found out, for example, that during a specific um, Tantra ritual, I, I'm now recorded, I think, seven of them in the last five years. In 75% of the cases, we have the same pattern in the, on, on, on the two REGs. So, so it seems like that, that if a certain quality is repeated, um, we, we, we get um, similar patterns in the data. And of course, it would be very interesting to use um, deep learning to discover, maybe we discover much more of them. So in this case, it's very obvious. So you can see with, uh, on the first sight that they are, they are repeating, but there might be much more on that. So, and I think so it might be useful in the, in the, in the later stage to use uh, deep learning for, for this um, type of research. But in, in, the, in, in the thing that if AI gets conscious, I, I totally agree with Mike, I don't think so. Thank you for you sharing your insights today. I, it's been a super valuable conversation and I'm the, the topics that we are researching, it's very exciting. It's uh, cutting edge and I'm really looking forward to see how how your research unfolds over coming years. And I wish you both big success on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I was able to cover, uh, like I, I know your research is a lot more deeper than um, I could cover in this conversation, but if there's anything I missed you would like to talk about, um, please please feel, to, feel free to share. I think I, I would, maybe in the end, I would like to share some, just two slides of my data that you get yeah. an impression what repetitive, yeah. So I, I hope I can share my screen. So, yeah, I, I think you see. Okay, good. See, so I think, yeah. yeah, I think that the, the the first is very one of the data. I think it's this was the first ritual I was I was looking for. And you see here in twenty four hours, you see two peaks, small one and a big one. 
the big one was during a main ritual and the smaller one was during a pre preparation for the main ritual. So this is a 24 hours plot. And this one, two, three, these are the, the, uh, just the points, the documentation, the metadata I wrote down during the, um, during this um, the session where I was recording. And you see that the algorithm recovered the starting points of the, of two events, which is a segmentation of the, of the data, which fit exactly the segmentation, which were done during the seminar. So this is the, was the first match I found. Um, I could reproduce this um, three months later, nearly in an exact way, even with a similar pattern. So you see here, both random walks are out of the parabola in an, in an anti-correlated way. And this actually is also against chance of this peak is uh, one to 800,000. So it's really, really a huge peak. Yeah, we, are around in a, we have a set score or C score of around five in one event. The first one was around four, this is, is around five. And I think this repeating pattern is maybe one of the most fascinating things I found. So, I recorded the same type of ritual um, with um, different people in different years, and I found this. So you will see here correlated data hours long. Yeah. So here you see the, the day times, and the first one was was actually the second uh, time to ritual I was recording. So you have here from you have here six hours of correlated data. The interesting thing is you see that the two random box stick together very closely and stay along the parabola, so around the board of significance. But this is for one. So actually, if both are out, uh, you have a, a much higher probability because you can multiply the probabilities. So that both actually at the same time are at, at, at the parabola. The, the probability is very low. Yes, exactly 1 to 400. And the interesting thing is that exactly when the ritual ended, you see that the, the random box separating. And this was uh, in July 20, 2022, the same type of ritual, which much more progressed people. And you see, I think on the first sight, how highly ordered the data are for over hours again. And exactly at the end of the ritual, the random walk split up and go, go back to normal. And inside this data, they're actually, especially this, this plot, they're we have a high degree of self-similarity in the data. So like in the Samantha plot, um, uh, fractals. So if you, if you zoom into the data, you will find in a smaller time scale the same structure, and it's a bob going down. And I, f I found a lot of uh, meaningful uh, relations in this self-similar data to the ritual. So this is, I think, in two minutes, maybe one of the most exciting uh, data plots. And you see, I think, also for, for a lay person, it's clear this is not unstructured random data without any history. This is highly structured. This is my, my last point, because I think it's we are coming from hard science and what we're monitoring is hardcore statistics and uh, hard scientific data. And then we bring bring in the soft scientific part, the documentation of what is happening, of the quality, how people are feeling, and these two are then corresponding. So just to give you a short impression, what, what I meant with repeating patterns and significant correlated data over hours. I have a quick question for you, Wolf. Uh, yes. Are you seeing those spikes before the event happens or after the event happens? This, the plot now um, was actually not a spike. This was the um, the whole, the, uh, the, the, the pattern shows that the correlation was all along the ritual over hours. Yeah. So, so, so there are spikes. Is, I, I think it's, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I think, we have we have different parts. So we, spikes means we have a short. Uh, this is a short peak of of a, a short lasting anomaly, which m might get quite high. This was the first plot. Yeah. So this happened also during the ritual, but in this type of ritual we have a long lasting correlation. So it's building up actually the whole time. So of course the longer the, the data 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 structured, the higher the anomaly gets. It's a building up anomaly and within this anomaly you then have spikes building up on this anomaly so we see patterns in patterns in this case uh, and, do, you, do yes. you also have the, the, the plot from from the ICU in Spain in this presentation uh, give me a, so maybe have, maybe you see short short peaks I'm not sure um I, I don't think so Something. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, not in this one. No. 
This is no. only part. So the one is a long-term relation which was over hours, yeah, and, and the random two random event generators should not do that for five to two hours, yeah. So uh, this is the one thing, and the, the second thing is so if you have short events which are really then on time, yeah. This are, so a short event maybe it's five to ten minutes, in this range. So our, our accuracy is always um, plus minus one minute. So this is the range where the the um, accuracy of our documentation is, and I would say short peak with um, of course the most interesting part is always the maximum, yeah, maximum of peak. Uh, so short one is five to ten minutes, but this one was was about uh, so this long term relation was about seven hours. So we have everything. And everything in between, of course, in this long-term correlation, you also have um, short spikes embedded. And then you would expect, okay, these short spikes, in this case, I had an audio recording of the data, the short spikes, I was expecting something significant is happening. And it happened there. So I, I didn't find anything in the data which has had no relation to an event. This is in this type of ritual, which is highly significant. Uh, so basically, if you have two different devices, uh, uh, weirdoscope devices, uh, there is a strong correlation between what's being measured. So you mean if you have four random, random event generators? Is this your question? Uh, so, no. So go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. In, so, in the, so in this is uh, both random event generators are inside one weirdoscope. Yeah. And because of the entanglement, they behave like this. Yeah, so they, they really do for a long time the same thing. We have some experiments running. Uh, Wolf can maybe tell you something. Yes. With, with multiple vertoscopes. So you have one vertoscope with two random event generators and the second one with two random event generators and maybe a third one. Yes, in this case, you, what, 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 what we saw, and I think this is according to the uh, theory of Walter von Lukadu, we don't see an enhancement in the signals. So the information stays the same. It, it looks like it actually, the information is then, um, so you see the main events are mainly on all of the three viroscopes, but the detailed information is then shared between the three devices. So we, we, we get not out more of the more information, we get the same information, but it's divided among three viroscopes. This is basically what we found. But we have, um, for example, I, I had the same type of ritual I was investigating. And I had, um, this was this year, I had three viroscopes inside and two of them showed the, the, the pattern I just showed you. And the third one did not. The third one showed an anti-correlated pattern, but both showed more or less an anomaly in the in the same range. And this you would expect. Yeah. So, adding more measurement devices would not uh, increase the information you can measure. I think two much two as a one video scope, but we have to do more research on that. Might be the optimum number actually for this type of uh, kind of investigation. But I think it's important that inside the viroscope or, or also in the analysis software, we only look to the correlations between these two random number event generators. So we are this. This is what we are searching for. We search for a common pattern in this uh, a common pattern at a certain time. So we are correlating always with the time. So only if two REGs, random event generators, do the same thing at the same time, then we will see. Uh, a, 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 a peak or the, the software will detect an anomaly. If only one um, goes out of, shows a significant pattern and the other one stays at, um, at random in the middle of, of these parabolas, we, we don't have a significant plot here. Yeah. And what's the application in the near term you plan to use wireloscopes for? I think um, maybe the, the most important, one of the most important parts is we, we try to empower people. So what we are now planning is that people do their own research with them. Um, so we, we so I'm in an in international research group called Oregano. Um, and we are currently investigating um, the process of dying in an ICU in Spain. And there will be another hospital joining in the near future. And we have two vitoscopes in um, ambulances there. This is one part. So this goes more into the research of um, in a medical environment. And I personally will continue my research and uh, with the Tantra seminars. Uh, 
because I think it's a very rich group experience. Uh, that there are a lot of different types of um, experience there in this integral tantra, and there is a lot of of um, questions we can answer there. It's it's a, it's a certain kind of lab laboratory for me because I'm getting their reproducible results in in with together with this um, Institute of Integral Tantra in Germany, and there are a lot of research questions we, we I want to answer there in this setup. Yes, but I think. Mm -hmm. yep. Continue. I think the idea of the Vitoscope, so from Vir Technologies, that we give people the tool um, to do their own research, give them a trainer trainer program or some some training program. What actually the statistical output of the software means. So, we have, so we don't want to see people saying, "Okay, there is a peak. My healing works. I'm the best healer in the world." This is not how it is intended to use. It should be um, a device which <clears throat> empowers people to do their own research and to build up a community which is then sharing results and discussing what they found, what, what, what we found together. So I, I'm finished, Mike. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, so we have some people already that, that have uh, gotten some of the videoscopes and they are doing measurements somewhere, so uh, different groups. Um, and um, yeah, we we waiting for we, we gave a, a first uh, training session about the uh, usage of the software of the analysis software and uh, about uh, uh, how to interpret this. We will have some more trainings, of course, and and um, so people are, are now starting to use that. And uh, hopefully this community platform will be up soon so that we can then, if you have interesting results, we'll share them. Of course, the main event is then the Science and Consciousness Conference in, in Broughton, uh, also this year in November. So uh, maybe we will get there uh, some interesting results. Um, yeah, so that's it from the scientific view. Then there will be, um, which we, we are working now is, um, uh, device the mind lamp, which we call it, yeah, which is based on the same principle, but it does not do the scientific analysis, but uh, the the output. So how the if there are peaks inside, then then the lamp will 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 uh, change in, in color and brightness and things like that, so that you can maybe put it into into groups that that do some some work together, maybe meditation group or some some uh, energy work or whatever. And then see what what, what it does exactly the, the, how the lamp reacts to this and, and so things like that. So not quite sure how this will work out. So this is still in a quite a prototype. Yeah, not not not, not really uh, far advanced, but uh, we will hope that we'll have one exemplar already for the science and consciousness in November. And um, yeah, there are some other applications which. Are interesting, but we 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 are not exactly sure how this will work out. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate this conversation. And um, if people want to find out more about your um, about the device and your work, go go where dot com go website. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Wolf. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm fine too. Thank you a lot. Uh, thank you a lot for inviting us. And I, I also want to thank the audience for um, your feedback. Thank you.